New York hardcore? What's what is New York hardcore? What is New York hardcore? Me and him. <laughs> Hey, what's up everybody? Um, I wanted to just talk. I usually come on here with an essay that I wrote out, but just to get a little bit more comfortable with y'all as a community, for y'all to get to know me a little bit more outside of my overactive thinking brain, and just letting you know some of my opinions. So I wanted to basically come up with a segment. <laughs> I keep making this joke and maybe it'll take off online because it doesn't do well in person. <laughs> but I say instead of six degrees of Kevin Bacon, it's six degrees of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. That's the joke. And this episode of six degrees of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy we're going to talk about gatekeeping and music can you name me three obituary songs okay hmm. <laughs> Shit. i'm kind of drunk right now <laughs> that's right ida that's right yeah do you have something to say to the people exactly this might be one of the most controversial things I've ever said on this channel, but I grew up as a hardcore kid. Okay, you guys can stop booing. <laughs> hardcore was my outlet as a kid who grew up working class and working poor. I'm from Brooklyn. Both of my parents are from Bed-Stuy with roots in the South, but both sides of my family moved to Brooklyn to escape Jim Crow. Growing up in the projects for anybody who's familiar, it's not an easy thing to do. It is segregated housing, to be completely frank. I understood real class disparity as a kid through my experience in growing up in the projects. Because it's something as simple as just noticing like what people can eat versus what you can eat, what you can afford to wear or not. So my parents wanted to give my brother and I a better life. And in fifth grade, we moved to New Jersey. And then we weren't among other working class people anymore. We were the poorest among middle class people in our school. And that was a really difficult situation growing up. I was homeless a couple times as a kid as well in New Jersey, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, trying to hold up appearances with kids who have the opportunity to do hobbies and they could afford going to get their SAT and their ACT and go to prom and all these things that I had a real struggle with because my family was really poor at the time. Uh, and I had very little outlets then to express my anger and frustration about uh, being working class until I found hardcore. <laughs> my brother and I grew up, grew up really close with each other. He skateboards and I used to skateboard too, but I fell a couple times really fucking hard and did not get on it seriously since. <laughs> I can cruise, but <laughs> getting concussed at like 12 will do that to you. <laughs> Growing up playing video games with my brother, video games like Tony Hawk, that exposed us to punk rock. But not just that, we had a pretty unique upbringing when it comes to music as well because my family is full of musicians. My father is a bass player and a guitar player. And growing up, he played in my family church's band. And I grew up in my family church's choir. And it's not just any choir, they're pretty serious. The adult choir had an album and it was, uh, I forget, it won an award at some point, a Christian award, whatever that world is, you know. <laughs> I block a lot of that part of my life out. Yeah, so I grew up highly exposed to music in so many different ways. And it's always just been an integral part of me. And my father always exposed us, my father and my mother always exposed us to music that we were completely unfamiliar with. Kid you not, my brother and I were listening to Japanese music from karate soundtracks in first and second grade. <laughs> 
懐かしい風。One of the first hip hop、uh, acts I've ever listened to in my whole life was a tribe called Quest. Big music is our lifestyle, man. Because, once again, living in Bed Stuy, we had exposure to a lot of great hip hop and jazz. So, that made me and my brother really open to different types of music. So, when games like Tony Hawk came out, it made it So much easier to want to be engaged and involved in these genres of music. So that really exposed me to punk in general as a whole, that video game. Also, I'll never forget my brother and I we were at a gas station. I was probably 10, he was probably 11 at Tops. And we were looking, and there was this、uh, dollar CD pile, and there was a punk compilation in there. And It looked really cool, so my brother and I bought it. It had to be maybe one or two dollars. That had to be like <laughs> 1999 or 1998.、Um, and it had bands like Discharge, The Plasmatics on there.、Um, they had some oi bands on there.、Uh, yeah, it just exposed me and my brother to really fucking cool music really, really young.、Um, so there was this convergence of like, This influence of all this gospel influence and the discipline of that, and having the exposure to hip hop just being in Brooklyn, and having my parents show us funk, soul, jazz, all these different types of interesting music from soundtracks and movies and film, because both my parents are huge film heads. So we were exposed to a lot of interesting things really early. And then Tony Hawk, you know, we <laughs> were listening to punk and stuff like that. It blew our little minds. Especially back then.、Um, so I, I was sold from, I want to say, 10 on. Alternative or hard hitting music was the only thing that really excited me. I literally can't remember the first time I listened to Tight Black Pants by the Plasmatics on that record. <laughs> And to this day, it's still my favorite plasmatic song. Wendy O. Williams is one of my favorite artists of all time, and I would love to do a video about her life one day, just in general, because she inspires me a lot. But yeah, just having exposure to those things so early really shaped who I am.、Uh, listening to like Blink 182 and Limp Biscuit and all of that, especially back then, it was pretty rare for. Children of color to be listening to those things, and my parents knew that, and they really did cultivate it. They didn't always understand, but they encouraged us to be different. They knew that we were, and they allowed us to be,、um, even though they straight up were very confused most of the time, especially my mom when it comes to me.、Um, I would say from ages 11, 12, 13, I obviously was going through puberty, and I was very emotional. <laughs> I was a、uh, hopeless romantic, watching a lot of romance movies and stuff like that. Really not even understanding the fullness of like, my expression of my sexuality or my gender at the time, but just knowing I had really, really big feelings and needed an outlet. So I used to songwrite so much. I wrote so many songs back then. I have notebooks. I'm not sure if I still have them, but I had notebooks and notebooks of lyrics. I know I have access to some of the lyrics from back then. They were so emo and a little like alarming if you read back, if you are unaware of like the screamo phase of the time. Back then, that was when I was really into bands like Senses Fail and Boys Night Out and things like that. But before I even got into those bands fully at like 14, I got into Good Charlotte. Joe, the last thing you plucked? My eyebrows. Really? Yeah. What do you do, the middle of it? Just a little, like, just a little, you know, cleaning up every, every month or so. They were, outside of、uh, Tony Hawk, my full exposure <laughs> into hardcore and punk. And I always tell people this because I'm not ashamed of where my roots are, you know. A lot of people try to cool guy things in hardcore and punk and metal and all these alternative spaces in general.、Um, And I always thought that was so corny. Like, I'm not gonna pretend one day I fell out of the sky and just started listening to Bolt Thrower. Doing albums, you've always got that in your mind. It's come down to do the album. 
and get it as best as you can. So if a person takes, you know, four days to put the tracks down, it's four days, you know, there's no mm. pressure on anyone really to get it within two or three. It yeah. takes a week, it takes a week, but it has to be right and the person knows that, that they have to put the tracks down as a road and as tight as possible. So there's, no point takes, pu- there's no point pushing people, is there? Otherwise, you know, it, it just... It doesn't get you doesn't anywhere, anywhere really. so you have to more pressure on just leave you, leave you to it, and it comes out, and it, you know, eventually. Yes. Everyone knows within it's themselves good. that they have got a bit of pressure on them, yeah. and doesn't need anyone else to tell them that. Yeah, they exert on yourself, really. There's obviously a progression that happened that started with Limp Bizkit and Good Charlotte, but straight up, I was obsessed with Good Charlotte. Um, the anthem came out, I thought they were so fucking cool, I saw them on Fuse. Um, it was so dope to look at, I thought Benji and Joel were super cute, I liked Joel more. Um, some people are team Joel, some people are team Benji. I've always been team Joel. Uh, I like a pretty boy, can't, <laughs> can't even deny that part of my, myself, you know? But they would always be wearing shirts that said like mad ball on it or new york hardcore that's the symbol the new york hardcore symbol and shit and me being undiagnosed at the time but always very curious i'm like what what is this about what's what's a who's h2o who's mad ball who's dms you know and i started looking those things up because good charlotte was my favorite band and they talked about them in their lyrics and also wore their shirts So that's how I got exposed to hardcore. And then I realized, wait a second, these people are just like me. Hardcore started with uh, black and brown kids of color and white working class kids from New York City who were, you know, in the poverty level or below the poverty level. Hardcore is straight from the streets and for the streets especially back then and hearing them talk about their challenges with stuff was so empowering for me as a young teenager at like 13 14 years old because at that point i didn't hear anybody talk about the struggle anywhere i didn't know anybody else felt the way that i did about being poor i knew my parents did the best they could but i knew always from a very young age that there was inequality going on because like i said growing up in the projects you can kind of tell when you are exposed to other people's living experiences, how different yours is. When you go somewhere, you're like, oh, people have backyards. <laughs> people having access to do their hobbies and things like that. That's not really common for poor kids. But in hardcore, I found a place, I found a voice. And it meant so much to me because it validated me at the time. I was searching for something. And as a poor kid growing up, in a majority white school, um, coming from the city, you know, I'm a city kid who is now transplanted in this overwhelmingly white and rich environment, and I'm autistic and have eczema at that point, over like 60 to 70 percent of my body, and <laughs> and I'm dark skinned and I'm femme and I'm shy, you know, people made fun of me. I got made fun of a lot. I was bullied incessantly. And everybody denies it now because of how I look now and who I am now. But I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Baby Destiny cried almost every night some some school years. You know what I mean? Because it was easy to pick at someone like me at the time. Hardcore was my refuge. I went to my first show at 12. It was a battle of the bands. And my first alternative show. My first show ever was actually Morris Day in the Time, and I will never not tell people that because I think that's so fucking cool. Uh, My parents took me and my brother to go see Morris Day in the Time, and that was my first experience with real live music outside of the church. I saw live music all the time growing up, and especially because of my father, there was always live music in the house. But actually seeing musicians outside of people I was related to blew my mind and outside of just the television because once again I grew up as a Pentecostal kid which is important context for all of this. The kids that listen to this music are killing themselves and each other because of it. The music is called heavy metal. I was bitten by the bug of live music and shows and from then on that was my hobby. I was obsessed with live music and going to shows. I used to collect flyers. I would go to every show that I could. And like I said before, I was really poor growing up. So 
Sometimes I would save my lunch money just to go to a show. Back then, shows were 10 bucks. Uh, so I'd save, you know, my lunch money for a couple days uh, so I could get money for the show, maybe money for uh, gas money for my friend uh, to take me there. If I could, um, if I got allowance, if I, if I had the opportunity to have extra money at some point, I would save up for merch. But I was too poor for merch. Like, even when back then when shirts were only 20, 30 bucks, I couldn't afford them back then because I, like I said, at some point I was actually homeless. Uh, so I used to make my own merch, uh, used to make my own patches, paint them, make my own shirts and things like that and replicate things that I saw because I still wanted to fit in in the environment that I thought meant the most to me. But hardcore, like <laughs> most genres, unfortunately in America, and especially if they're white male dominated, so gatekeepy. You name three tool songs. <laughs> oh my god, I know. Just on principle, because I am just like a little white girl, I'm not answering the question. Because I don't need to prove myself. And this is the main point of this video, right? I wanted to bring up hardcore, my experience with hardcore in relation to Cowboy Carter, and I promise it will all make sense. So, me going to shows, even though I love the bands, I showed up and showed out, I still got made fun of at those places. Like, I got made fun of less, but it wasn't still a safe haven for me as an autistic, uh, weird kid who's poor, because hardcore at the time, this is the early 2000s, y'all, 2003, 2004, uh, and up and up until now, uh, these spaces were not open for people like me at all. I, for the longest time, I was the only black girl that would go to shows in Central Jersey. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's really funny too because I'll talk to people or I'll meet people from back then and they won't even remember me and it's not that I wasn't there it's just that I was invisible to them because like I said before hardcore is a white male club <laughs> when we first got into hardcore even before we thought of making a band uh, it was just an outlet it was a place to go every weekend where you could go and you could go nuts you know, you get on that dance floor and no matter what happened to you during that week, you got it out. So I didn't matter, even though I was there and still participating, buying merch, supporting the bands, following the bands. People looked at me like I didn't belong. And I actually have a lot of experiences where I was bullied by bands that I looked up to and also grew up with in some instances that put me down because to them I didn't belong. And there's opportunities where I wanted to start bands with people and they would shut me down simply based off of who I am and what I look like, not because of what I can do, which is so funny because I mean music like punk and hardcore and metal are not known for their technical prowess, right? It's about the, the will to do it, but that's the whole point of it these people who would deny me or laugh at me that actually happened to me a couple of times when i told people i wanted to be in the band they laughed at me is because they don't think that i belong in that space they they don't validate me as a fan of this music right they think that they are the gatekeepers and i'm on the outside so i'm i don't belong in it to create it because who am i because, like I said before, this is six degrees of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, right? Black and brown people started hardcore, but that's not where it ended up, right? Uh, when Connecticut got involved, and I love Youth of Today and Bold and all the, uh, no, Bold's from New York, but Youth of Today <laughs> um, <laughs> and all those bands uh, from Connecticut at the time, that era of hardcore, got involved, but when suburban kids got involved in hardcore, they brought a level of conservatism and elitism that wasn't always the case in hardcore music that I think still remains today. Now, it's more about uh, whoever has the most amount of money uh, and who can appear the most hard. Not who is the most hard, it's who fits the bill like of the aesthetic, right? And if we're going by those standards, poor kids are usually not going to 
meet the mark of that because they don't have money, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm broke, nigga, I'm broke! People think that they are allowed to tell you what is and what isn't based on who they are. And this happens in all types of alternative music for me, just as a black femme person. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, this has happened literally hundreds of times, probably, since I've said before. I've been going to shows since I was 12, and I'm 32, so 20 years of going to shows. M more recently, I went to um, an electronic show, and I had a ministry shirt on, and uh, a guy came up to me and asked me if I knew who ministry was and he also asked me if I was there for the bands it's like no I just stumbled upon this fucking event like I'm here to rob the place like what do you think I'm here for wearing the shirt for <laughs> you name me three protest the hero songs uh, whatever you know okay well Kaziah starts off with no stars over Bethlehem second track heretics and killers third track divinity within fourth track Bray the hatchet track five uh, Nautical, track six, blindfolds aside, track seven, she who mars the skin of the gods. Where are we at? Eight, uh, turn soonest to the sea, divine suicide of K. First EP, right, with sound of truth. I mean, they, they don't give a shit about that. And then they did another EP that they don't give a shit about. <laughs> it's so crazy that there's this attitude of you thinking that you own alternative music or you thinking that you, you're the gatekeeper, you, you're the one who allows certain people in and out of the space or like I'm the one who's the visitor in this space when techno and electronic music uh you know originated from Detroit and Chicago created by black teenagers or if we want to get into the weeds of it all hardcore is comes from rock and roll which was created by black people and this is where it comes into relation to Cowboy Carter. <laughs> Finally! Because when I listened to Cowboy Carter recently, um, this is what all these feelings started to come back up for me for. I really, really enjoyed that album, and I really hate when people try to discount Beyonce. Like, there's plenty you can uh, critique her on. She's a billionaire. There's no such thing as an ethical billionaire. But honestly, it's fucked up and obvious to me that it's massage noir that people go out of their way to talk about how they don't like her music when trying to critique her. And you don't have to like pop music, but you also can't deny when a record is just good. If you understand music, you know that sometimes music is objective. It is not a subjective fact. And Honestly, Cowboy Carter, objectively, is an amazing album. You don't like the Beyonce album and you don't get it, you just don't really like black music that much. And it's cool, and that's fine. That's fine. Wow. You like certain types of black yeah. music. Wow. You like black music <laughs> presented in a certain way. You like things, but you don't like to venture outside your comfort zone. And by the way, I want to reiterate once again, that's okay. That's like saying, like, no disrespect, but. Yeah. That's, and then that's here exactly comes the disrespect. That's exactly Just because you, well, no, you, you put in nice, long, eloquent words. This. That's just an objective fact. You don't have to like Beyonce, you don't have to like her voice, you don't have to have her in your rotation, but you have to know objectively she is good at what she does. And the only reason why people start to put that into question is because she's a black woman, right? And it's crazy because she's also one of the most light-skinned, uh, conventionally attractive black women in our celebrity, right? But she still gets the brunt of it which goes to show if it's bad for her trying to break into country music and just expand from the ideals of what people think she's supposed to do because of how she looks, then what's it like for the rest of us? It's fucking ass for the rest of us. As I mentioned, hardcore was not a walk in the park for me whenever I tried to participate. You know what I mean? Like I said, I've been around for a long time, so I know a lot of people, and everybody you look up to is not always a good fucking person um, because it's still a boys club. It's still white supremacy. There's still this idea that only certain people's anger is validated. But if hardcore is a music to express your aggression, why is white male rage so important to it? Why can't other aspects of people's rage be a part of it? A lot of racism and bullshit and hardcore broke my heart to keep it a bean. 
and put me away for it for about 10 years. But things have been changing all across the board, not just hardcore, but tattoos, other genres of music in general. We are carving our spaces out as people of color in general and marginalized individuals and really just going for it and not allowing people to tell us what we can and can't do anymore. And that's what I've been doing. I experienced my last form of gatekeeping, I wanna say, almost a year and a half ago. I was in a band for a little bit and I was being treated like I didn't belong there, like they were doing me a favor to give me the opportunity to be in their band. But as I mentioned, I have music in my family. So I don't need permission from you to make music when it's inside of me. So I've been making music ever since and that's why I like posting my DJing and my music because it's very liberating for me. And honestly, I don't care if I get views on that or not. <laughs> if I do, that's sick. But if I don't, that's okay too because it's genuinely just for me knowing that I'm capable of doing it and making good stuff. Would you be a musician if nobody ever heard you? Sure. Why? Because I love music. It's in my head, I can't get it out. So you listen? Yeah. You're hearing it yourself? I hear it now. And not allowing people to to dictate what I can and can't do. There was literally almost 15 years of my life that I did not make music at all because people told me that I couldn't make music. They told me I couldn't make hardcore. They told me I couldn't write alternative music because of who I am. And that deterred me from making it all together, which is so fucked up, but just like Cowboy Carter, it sounds like this has been the experience for Beyonce also, that this album was in her heart for a long time and that she was not allowed to express herself in that way based on people's ideals of what, as I mentioned before, blackness is so expansive, you cannot dictate it based on one particular type of thing or particular viewpoint. You have to allow people to be human beings and fully faceted individuals, allow them to show up as themselves and show you what their blackness is because it's going to be different for everybody you know what i mean i want to make techno music i want to make hardcore i want to make metal i want to make funk i want to make whatever i want because i am well, i'm like the universe <laughs> i contain multitudes we all do you can't keep trying to gatekeep what can't be gatekeeped creativity cannot be uh in a cage it can't be leashed if you want to live in a creative way, which will benefit everything in your life, be a better person in your family, be a better, uh, if you're starting a new business, do a better job of starting a new business. It, it'll, it's all the same. You know, I don't really know anything about music. It, it's, it's more a way of looking at the world and wanting it to be the best it could possibly be and doing whatever it takes to be the best it could possibly be and being true to knowing that no one else knows. You know, I, I'm not saying I know, but that n everyone's idea is as valuable as mine. You know, we're all, we're all creators. And in general, I just really appreciate all that Beyonce has been doing for music because of Cowboy Carter. I found out about so many new black new and old black country artists because of this and in general like i said before and as far as alternative music things are changing there are some sick uh bands out there uh i'm thinking bleed the pigs primitive man zulu soul glow buggin move there's so many good bands knife wound uh, there's so many good bands now out there because you can't take away that experience from me there's no way some white dudes on Long Island are more hardcore than me when I'm from the Tompkins Projects. Like, <laughs> let's be for real. So yeah, gatekeeping is an extension of white supremacy because it dictates whose creativity is valid or not. It dictates whose opinions are worth listening to, whose feelings are worth validating. That's why none of that shit is real. If you want to make music, go for it. If you want to make YouTube videos, go for it. I had no idea what I was doing when I started this. I still barely do, but you guys apparently like it. So I'm going to keep going for it. I didn't know what I was doing when I started DJing. When I first started writing songs, there wasn't even Google back then. I just started writing them. 
I approach life as a human being with opportunity, not based on the parameters that people perceive that I'm supposed to have because I'm black and femme and come from a working class background. That's your limitations of who I am and what I can be, not mine. So make that music, start that band, do your YouTube channel, paint, draw, start your clothing line, whatever the fuck it is. Don't listen to naysayers. Art is not supposed to be gatekept. Art is supposed to be free for everybody. And if we keep telling people only certain people deserve to make art, we'll lose so much of it. From the beginning, I never thought any of the things that I'm doing were possible or uh, realistic. And I just did things out of the love of them, thinking I would have real jobs. And, you know, like the things that, that my passion would be my hobby and I'd have a job to support my hobby. Yeah. And it just magically turned out different than that without me knowing it was possible. And not only that, we'll allow people who have bigoted ideas of what creativity and art are supposed to be still dictating these things. We'll still have white supremacy dictating our idea of what art and creativity are supposed to be. I dated a guy that was a musician also, and he was very intimidated by me in general because I am the type of person, like I said, who'll just go for things and not let people's bias or my own limitations stop me, which is not an issue to me, um, but it is for others. And I wrote a song and he said it didn't count because I did it with my MIDI keyboard to write the guitar parts. Um, so I said that to say, stay away from people who put you down when you're pursuing something you also, because that's their limitations about what's holding them back from them doing their thing. They have something in their head that they were told by somebody else, or maybe they told themselves that they can't do, and now they're projecting onto you their limitations for you. So when that happens, cut them off if you can, or just turn them out, because you will never get good at anything if you don't try it in the first place. You don't have to be bold like me and post stuff that you aren't super confident with if you don't want to, but it gets less intimidating when you do it. Write that song, start that band, and fuck everybody else who tells you you can't. And uh, punks can listen to Cowboy Carter. Don't be a weirdo. Music is good. If you bitches can like tolerate listening to the Beatles and Paul McCartney, if y'all can make passes for John Lennon and his bitch ass, y'all can listen to Beyonce and listen to that culturally significant album, which is literally a sonic historical lesson, anthropologically, of black music. So don't be a weirdo, just listen to it. Start your band, I don't know. This is me being a little bit off kilter, but I, I hope this I hope this goes well. I'm, I'm gonna upload more stuff like this soon. Just me speaking off the cuff and keeping it real, peace. Talk about it. Do it, do it. Don't lie about it. Do it, do it. Talk about your shit, man. That's so good you gotta do it, do it. 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 Do it, do it.